So, um, for the Zoom people, this is the next event in our session. We have Eve Blau. So today she's going to be speaking about Baku, which is a city at the heart of global oil production. And I believe that her research on this city is crucial for anyone that's trying to understand the relationship between energy and form. And as my students can attest, I often insist that we are going to be unable to understand how transition will occur going forward unless we understand how it has occurred in the past. So Soviet cities are wonderful case studies in this sense, as they deliberately used architecture and urban form to overturn a pre-existing world order and, of course, establish the one that must now be overturned today. So without saying any more and taking any more of our time, I will turn it over to Professor Eve Blau. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and it's my first time, so uh, it's all new to me and um, very exciting. And I also uh, find the research that you're doing and uh, the sort of larger research project, the exhibition and so on that, that this lecture series is part of, as, as I understand it. So um, my lecture today is going to address these larger problematics of the lecture series and the research uh, project and the exhibition, as I understand it, the, uh, the problematics are to interrogate the relationships between architecture, modernity, carbon, and urban spatial form by engaging the, uh, the operative and I think very highly productive uh, concepts are of carbon modernity and carbon form. And I'm going to engage them historically uh, through a close examination of the long history of those entanglements in Baku, which is the capital of Azerbaijan, and uh, the original oil city, actually. The, it, okay, so here's a model of the city um, that was in the city, uh, in the city hall at the time, and it shows the center which um, there were more than 500 high-rise towers that were under construction, uh, in Baku at the time, and the tallest of these right here in the front was what's called the Flame Towers, um, formed by HOK, and they're symbols of Baku's famous uh, fire temple, which we'll get to uh, in a second. So there were also um, major cultural buildings by international architects, this one you may be familiar with, the Haidar Aliyev uh, Cultural Center by Zaha Fadid, and then, uh, which is one of the most famous, and then the carpet is given by an Austrian architect, uh, Hans Jans, which is perhaps the most bizarre, <laughs> but it certainly conveys what it's about. <laughs> so um, across the city, there were um, new buildings were replacing the old fabric of the city. And you can see that here, just the way in which these towers are encroaching on the old fabric of the city, and this is part of the, in the front of the foreground that had been uh, uh, demolished, taken away, and especially this was happening in um, the old industrial and residential districts. And outside the center, though, there was this vast uh, post-socialist landscape, these massive Brezhnev era uh, housing projects in the 1970s, uh, as well as really highly polluted landscape. Uh, and then uh, something that we got lost and, and we went into places we weren't supposed to, that there were refugees from the nagorno karabakh conflict who were living in amongst uh, these wells. And then in the downtown um, center of the city was also undergoing this massive urban facelift and recreating a uh, this stone-based, uh, purposefully, Palestinian uh, palace, a kind of reimagination of the first phase of capitalist urbanization uh, following the first boom, oil boom in Baku, when Baku was actually known as the Paris of the Caspian. Um, and so Paris continues actually to be uh, a major um, reference in Baku. So the dynamics uh, of surplus that are driving this development are what planners uh, studying urbanization in the Gulf states call post-oil urbanism. 
uh, and this is not um, uh, renewables, but it's actually urbanism that is generated by oil money, surplus revenue, rather than by oil production. And it's also it's what, what David Harvey calls uh, the spatial fix, which is uh, fixing investment spatially and embedding it uh, in land and uh, real property to create landscapes, new landscapes for uh, capitalist accumulation. accumulation. So Baku's uh, post-oil urbanization uh, is deeply invested in the city's history. And it's based on a very close reading, if not quite accurate, on the part of the city uh, urban elites of Baku as a modernization project in which oil and urbanism are inextricably bound uh, together. And actually you can, the, the history kind of, you can see the layers of it. Um, so here, this is the old uh, center, uh, the Muslim town, the center of the city. Then here you see these uh, institutions that were built in the late 19th century. Here you see some of the uh, large socialist um, institutional buildings, and then you get flame towers back. So let's turn to that history and look at three key episodes. Um, we're gonna go through these quite quickly. Um, the first is the earliest capitalist foundation of the oil industry and urbanization of Baku. It is the most important phase because it's the one where this relationship between oil and urban is first established. Then there's oil and urban planning in the Soviet planned uh, economy. Uh, we're going to focus on the, the sort of experimental period in the early years, and then the post uh, Soviet transition leading up to today, which will, uh, you've seen some of the images, um, and we'll deal with that quite quickly. So it's a succession uh, of radically different economic and political contexts in which, as I said, urban and industrial production develop synchronically. And I'm gonna say just a quick word about that and about the method uh, uh, and its uh, conceptual implications. So foregrounding, which is what I have been doing in this study, the synchronous uh, evolution of oil and urban production, um, what it does is it shifts the focus of the inquiry, of the research from urban and industrial forms to the processes which they were, which generated them and the condition in which they operated. And so what it does, in other words, it, it, uh, it shifts to the, the emphasis becomes uh, circulation and the transfer of practice-based forms of knowledge and to the production of difference. And I find that a very, that's part of my title, that it's the difference that oil makes uh, to urban formation. But it's also, and this is one of the things that impressed me when I started working on Baku, is the difference that the urban makes to industrial uh, formation, and in particular to oil. And specifically how urban ideas uh, impacted the operational culture of the oil industry. So, and here, I guess theoretically, this involves what Henri Lefebvre, who has been a big influence on my thinking uh, and my work, what he, in, what he calls in the Urban Revolution, his book, he calls it a reversal of a conventional way of looking at things, that conventional way being uh, that urbanization is a consequence of industrialization. It's an effect, a result, or a means of the industrial. And so instead, he argues that the problematic of industrialization, which has dominated capitalist uh, societies for more than two centuries, and I'm uh, quoting and paraphrasing him, is increasingly superseded by the urban, and the urban problematic, as he says, becomes uh, predominant. So I think that you know we can understand that too in terms of one of the, the greatest economic generators these days is investment in uh, in urban uh, real estate. So um, 
that's another way of thinking about it. So I think this is a useful lens for examining ways in which oil production and urbanization processes inform each other and how they generate this distinctive or these distinctive urban uh, and industrial formations and practices in modernizing Baku. So let's uh, see how that laid out on the ground. I apologize for this crack map. Uh, a little bit of background here to situate Baku uh, geographically and historically. Um, for centuries, Baku had been one of the many, on one of the many connecting routes uh, of Silk Road. And you can see Baku is right here. This is Caspian Sea. Baku is this little piece that sticks out. And you can see the various different Silk Roads. And it was also on the pilgrimage route from India to the Fire Temple in Surhani. Uh, the Akshaman Peninsula, which is where Baku is, which is the original site of Zoroastrianism, of fire worship, uh, because oil and gas were so close to the surface that they would ignite spontaneously. So this is uh, one of the, the characteristics or parts of the environment of Baku and the Akshaman Peninsula that, that oil is just bubbling up. So, um, in the early 1800s, uh, the region was conquered by Russia. And um, so here you could see this is Russia. Here is Baku. Uh, you can see uh, Russia, Russia sort of extended down. So Baku became this, this frontier post on the defense line uh, of the military frontier of the Russian Empire. And that separated uh, Baku's Azeri population politically and culturally uh, from the rest of the Azeri population, the majority of which is in um, uh, the former Persia in Iran. And uh, that set Baku, that was the beginning of setting Baku on a different historical trajectory from the region. Now, the real turning point was uh, the industrialization of oil production. And so we're going to look at that development quickly. Um, oil and uh, natural gas reserves on the actual peninsula had been tapped for centuries. But even in the um, mid 19th century, the extraction methods were really primitive and inefficient. And crude oil was basically bailed, uh, seepage was bailed out. As I said, the oil was very close to the surface from these very shallow wells, and then it was transported in these carts, as you could see. Uh, you know, the barrels slung, you have one on the top, one on the bottom, um, you know, by uh, dumps uh, from the fields to the harbor in the Bay of uh, Baku. So large scale extraction, commercial extraction began in the mid 1870s and it was triggered by two consecutive events. Uh, the first was that the Imperial Oil Lands, which is this green area here, this is the city of Baku and the Bay of Baku, so these are the imperial, uh, the crown owned uh, um, oil lands. They were released for sale in 1872 and they were pressed and sold at public auction. And here, this is a map that shows the public auction. Uh, it's a blueprint of a map that we found in the um, Library of Congress, actually. So, and it shows who bought all of these uh, parcels. And so immediately, uh, 400 wells were drilled and um, the area became sort of covered in a forest of, uh, of uh, derricks. And you could see, I love this photograph here, where you could just see the density of it. And they were bringing in what were called uh, gushers. And uh, the second decisive event was the, in the early 1870s as well, was the arrival of the Nobels, <clears throat> the Nobel family. They were Swedish uh, Russian arms manufacturers. Um, the people who ran the oil business in Baku were the brothers of Alfred Nobel, you know, the inventor of dynamite and founder of the, uh, the Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Prize money actually came from Baku oil money. Um, and the father, their father had moved the engineering business from Sweden to St. Petersburg. They built a factory. They were arms manufacturers uh, producing artillery shells and mortars. And one of their great in inventions was uh, underwater mines, which they developed for the 
question. Maybe I'm just giving you a context for this whole thing. So one of the brothers, Robert Nobel, uh, went to the Caucasus in 1872 to buy hard walnut wood for gun stocks. And he arrived just as this auction was happening, and he decided to invest his walnut money in uh, a refinery and in oil land um, uh, in, in Baku. And this is the firm, uh, and they, they revolutionized the oil industry in Baku. They were engineers, uh, and the company was research-driven. So they were continuously developing new techniques for processing oil and also exploring new uses for petroleum products, um, including the production of uh, rubber. So they built the first uh, oil pipelines in Baku that you know, came down to the river. They also um, uh, developed the first oil tanker. This is a, a significant um, uh, development, actually. The first one was called the Zoro Aster. And so it was this compartmented um, ship and oil used to be transported in wooden barrels. <laughs> so this was, you know, compartments, it was a major innovation. And they also built a huge distribution network through <laughs> all of Russia and beyond, as you can see, and we mapped this to figure out, uh, you know, where this whole thing was going. So a number of other uh, European investors came, the Rothschilds built the railway, uh, they financed an oil company. And so by the 1880s, foreign capital had penetrated <coughs> into uh, the ba Baku economy. Uh, and it was linked and it linked Baku to this international uh, markets and also financial institutions really across the globe. So this was the beginning of global, uh, the global economy and global industries. And uh, so it attracted, you know, foreign oil, uh, foreign investment, but also um, expertise um, and skills. So uh, by the early 1900s, the, um, the Baku oil fields were supplying uh, kerosene and lubricants as well as fuel oil to Russia, to Europe, to parts of Asia and even to North America. Um, and here, this is just to show you that this is, um, you know, from a magazine, an American magazine, that was all about uh, Baku's oil. And in 1901, Baku was the leading producer of petroleum products in the world for a very short period, um, 1901. Um, but what's missing from this narrative, uh, uh, this historical, inherited historical narrative, and also from its reification in the contemporary transformation of Baku's urban fabric that we're seeing uh, today are the two most important conditions that I wanna explore here of Baku's early capitalist development. The first one was the distinctive organization of Baku's oil industry, which was uniquely actually invested in place and in the non-oil related economy. And secondly, the interdependency of industrial and urban, uh, uh, and urban form. So those conditions, I would say, are really uh, critical um, because I think they help us to recalibrate both the socio-technical entanglements of global oil production and urbanization processes and their impact on local environments in which they intersect. So it's that intersection of the global and the local that is really interesting here. And you only get to that if you really start to uh, dig down uh, historically. And they also complicate our reading of those environments. So let's look at them. Um, in contrast to other far from uh, oil extraction sites, uh, in which, like Baku, there were large foreign companies that were involved in the oil business, um, the oil industry in Baku was uniquely imbricated in both the local economy and in the long-term uh, social and political agendas of the local Azeri business elites. And here you see, this is a, a group of the local Azeri um, uh, businessmen known as the oil barons. Um, 
And it's interesting because uh, despite the, you know, Russia's discriminatory policies uh, towards Muslim entrepreneurs, which is pretty well known, Baku's local, local oil producers were involved not only in extraction, but also in production. Uh, they owned and operated a major share of Baku's oil wells, refineries, and subsidiary industries, and they were actively involved in developing and manufacturing new uh, petroleum products. So um, that's highly unusual. In the 1870s, they joined forces with the Nobels uh, to turn Baku into uh, what they called an experimental laboratory, uh, which was to be a center of research-based industrial practices. Um, and then this rapidly produced a continuous stream, actually, of new finished products uh, for international markets. And just as an example, uh, one of the most significant uh, innovations in market uh, was that as early as um, uh, the 1870s, Baku began producing these local oil uh, barons together with the uh, Nobels, began producing fuel oil on a large scale. And this was 30 years before anywhere else, including the United States. And um, by the 1870s and 1880s, the Russian fleet and the railways were uh, converted to oil fuel uh, steam engines converted from coal. Now, the significance of that is that it changed the economic and the political significance of oil. That, um, and this is something that we uh, know, but we need to remember that up until shortly before World War I, um, oil was a minor uh, commodity. It was kerosene, and it was uh, used for lighting, you know, as, as lighting oil. And uh, it was not a vital source of energy for machines, unlike coal. So it didn't have that kind of power and agency. Um, and at this point, when uh, with the the um, the invention that happened in Baku of being able to power steam engines with oil, it became a major um, uh, supplier for the defense and transport uh, infrastructure of the Russian state, and of course others as well. So that made the um, Baku oil producers rich uh, and influential, um, but it also, and it transformed Baku into uh, a global oil industry in the early 20th century. And here this shows the steam engines under production. And um, the distinctive organization, and this is what I'm getting to about this connection between oil and urbanism, oil, uh, oil modernity or carbon modernity in carbon form, that it generated its own very distinctive urban footprint. And this is something that I found absolutely fascinating in Baku. And that is uh, the industrial district of Baku, which is here, it was called the Black Town. Um, it was the center of oil production in Baku. And you can see it here on the map. And here you can see the piers um, that, you know, with the oil tankers and so forth. And here you can see these blocks that I'm going to describe. So this was the center of oil uh, processing and production in Baku. And it was also the first <clears throat> planned industrial district in the history of Russian uh, plan. So its urban plan, which you can see uh, over on the left, was uh, one of the clearest instances of this knowledge spillover between oil production and urban planning practices um, and their very distinctive logic. So here, the black town consisted of these very large blocks. Um, it's hard to tell here, but they were enormous blocks. I don't have the dimensions in my head, um, but it was square grid of these supersized urban blocks that were designed to accommodate 
all of this very complex infrastructure of the oil refining processes. So they, there were pipelines, railway tracks and cars, massive storage tanks, chemical factories and refineries, you know, warehouses, auxiliary industries and so forth. So it was a, a very complex uh, industrial uh, compound. And um, so the, the blocks themselves are huge, but they're also quite densely um, compacted together. And so it compacted all of these things together into this intense uh, and dense urban fabric uh, that linked the oil fields to the harbor and to the tankers uh, that transported it. What's interesting about this is it was a very flexible system that these large blocks could be organized in a whole range of different ways. Um, and here, this is an analysis of the different kinds of industries and the ways in which they could be organized uh, within the block. Um, and so that what this allowed for was that you could mix industries in a single block. You could also cluster related industries in the block and you could restructure them and recluster them. And so it was a, a structure, and this is the impact of the urban on oil, that fostered collaboration among producers and engineers and scientists. And it was this urban industrial environment of the black town, uh, that the spatial concentration, the shared techno, uh, socio-technical um, networks and infrastructure that enable this exchange and circulation of knowledge uh, and the cluster of innovations that um, uh, characterized the Baku oil industry and that you know, vaulted Baku to the pinnacle of global oil production at the turn of the 20th century. And so uh, I find that absolutely fascinating. And it was something that we discovered as we started to analyze these blocks and to, uh, I mean, a number of them actually um, were uh, used for housing during the Khrushchev period. But here we analyzed the way in which the blocks were used and we looked at this kind of fabric and you could see it. So here you see the density of these blocks in that environment. And you can also sort of see the, the mix. And here uh, you can see this is the sort of remnants of black town that's gradually being demolished uh, for this kind of thing. Actually, it has now been demolished. But at that time, it was still this, this amazing transitional moment. And you can see all of the, um, some of that clustering in the blocks. So, there's another particularity uh, of Baku's oil industry, and that was and, and another very important uh, factor is that uh, for Baku's local entrepreneurs, these uh, Muslim oil barons, oil was the means to uh, wealth, but it was also the means to self-determination. And this is something that was rare uh, in um, uh, at that time in, in oil and subsequently also. And they collaborated, these oil barons, um, many of whom were, you know, uneducated, uh, had started out as uh, workmen in the oil fields who gradually brought in these gushers and um, uh, made fortunes for themselves. Anyhow, they collaborated with Baku's Muslim intellectuals there was a very interesting, can't go into it, uh, intellectual community that, that uh, developed in Baku. And they established a broad range of cultural and welfare institutions. Uh, some of them you can see here, uh, hospitals, also parks, uh, vocational and technical schools, meeting rooms, many newspapers. And we mapped this when we were doing research. I took a group of students to Baku and we did a research. This is how the whole thing started, a research seminar in Baku where we started this research. So we were looking at these and we were tying them to who was making them and where they were located uh, in the city. And we were looking at who owned what in the, in the black town to understand how the, the, uh, the city developed. And there was also um, the first, uh, school for Muslim girls 
1911, uh, and here's an image, and here's the school. So it was a major um, structure, major institution. And they embedded these institutions in the urban fabric of the city, at, along with theaters and museums and hospitals, as I said, but city hall, government buildings, charitable institutions, and so on. So the result was an urban environment that was unique, really, among uh, these early oil extraction sites. Um, but it was also short-lived. So this is one of the things one finds talk about transition uh, in Baku. There were these amazing developments, and then they came to an end. And it was short-lived because urban density in Baku fostered industrial innovation, uh, it fostered cosmopolitan urban culture, but it also fostered political activity and political conflict and political unrest. And the oil fields, um, uh, the refiner, oh, here's more of that mapping of institutions uh, in the city. And you can see this is the old Muslim center and this is the 19th century city. Um, so the oil fields and the refineries uh, and the settlements where the workers lived were notorious actually for their appalling living uh, and working conditions. And in the early 1900s, Baku became the center of revolutionary activity uh, in the Russian empire. Uh, Stalin here uh, was a major operative. You know, he was from Georgia, which is in the Caucasus as well. And um, one of the interesting sort of sidebars here is that Baku was the center for the production of revolutionary uh, propaganda in Russia. And they were printing pamphlets by Lenin and Trotsky, and they were printed in uh, a basement in the old town, the old Muslim center, and disseminated throughout the empire by means of the Nobel's oil distribution network which is interesting. And the secret police were trying to figure out how was all of this stuff getting all over to all parts of Russia. Of course, this was not the Nobels who were distributing. It was the revolutionaries who were using the oil distribution networks to, uh, to spread, uh, to disseminate this, uh, you know, the propaganda. So, um, there were a series of strikes in the oil fields in 1903, 1904, 1905, and they erupted into uh, inter-ethnic violence, actually, that continues today between Azeris and Armenians. Uh, the oil fields were set on fire. These are from American newspapers, actually, these notices. Hundreds of wells were damaged and thousands of people were slaughtered. So um, this proto-revolution, which is what Lenin uh, called, he called it the Great Rehearsal, actually. Uh, it had a profound impact on Baku's foreign uh, oil investors and um, that I think had uh, serious consequences. Well, it did definitely for the organization of the oil industry and its relationship to urbanism because the large foreign firms that were operating in Baku were shocked by this violence. And also because the, the, it was not only the oil processing uh, facilities that were being attacked, but also banks and commercial premises and offices and so on. And so it seems to me very clear that the lesson that they took away from this experience in 1905 was that oil and urbanism is a volatile mix. And so I was trying to understand the relationship between oil and urbanism. And so consequently, in the uh, 1930s, for instance, when the British, when British and, and American companies began large scale exploitation uh, of the oil fields in the Persian Gulf, interestingly, they made sure to keep their operations and the enormous capital investments uh, entailed in processing oil far away from urban centers like Baku. And what's also interesting there is that as a rule, those sites did not become centers of research-based oil production. Uh, instead, foreign oil companies exported crude oil 
directly, took it out, didn't bother doing any, you know, uh, production with it, exported it by a pipeline to processing installations that were very far, uh, both from the extraction sites and from, you know, vibrant urban centers. And that has remained um, uh, the norm, actually. However, in Baku, and this is, you know, the particularity of Baku, oil and urbanism continued to be planned together. Um, and oil remained the research-based industry because beginning in, uh, the in 1920, exactly, the new Soviet state uh, set itself the task of um, shaping a new kind of industry and city in Baku. And so actually during the, the seven decades of Soviet rule from 1920 to 1990, more or less, the oil industry in Baku uh, took a radically different um, turn from the capitalist West. And I think that this is a really interesting phenomenon and an important one. Um, and it was not only operating within a command economy, but it was also operating within this larger international system of capital flows and commodities. And so that irreconcilable contradiction produced an oil industry that was distinctive uh, for its strong scientific uh, and engineering base, and also for the value that it put on the welfare of workers, uh, as we know, and also later on uh, for its inefficient uh, and uneconomic practices. However, um, to look at the early period, so in the 1920s, uh, Baku became the site of an experiment uh, an urban industrial experiment, which was the shaping of a new socio-technical formation, which was called the Oil City of Socialist Man. You know, there's the City of so Socialist Man, which was the project of the early avant-garde. But this is the Oil City of Socialist Man. And it was first given uh, spatial form in this um, uh, general plan of uh, 1927, which is only partially uh, executed and it was based on a lot of research, interesting into production methods and housing. And the mandate here to, to plan oil and urbanism together uh, required rescaling the city, right? So uh, rescaling it from the capitalist city, here's, oh, sorry, here's uh, the old city of Baku and extending out and along the whole, this is the Ashram Peninsula. Uh, so it incorporated the whole peninsula um, and to sort of enlarge it to the scale of the region. And it put emphasis, as you can see, oh God, sorry. Um, you can see a little bit here on infrastructure, connecting these two, um, and on developing this new form of uh, socialized urban living. And here, the result was this vast urban, uh, sort of inst urban and institutional infrastructure uh, that was built by the Soviet state. And so, one of the, the most interesting sort of representations of this was a journal called USSR in Construction that had a special issue um, uh, on the oil industry in 1931. It was, as you can see, for an international audience. So it was, you know, propaganda. But you get a sense of the, the urban and industrial environment that it created. Um, and here, these are some of the, uh, the spreads from the magazine where you can see the, the railways, the oil, but also these, uh, what were they called, cities, uh, a new city of gardens. So they were basically garden cities um, that were being built uh, out the center, uh, outside the center. And then, you know, major technical advances or technological ones with um, electrification, which was really important um, as part of the whole Soviet uh, program. And, uh, telephone and, and all of that. Uh, and then the inner city here, this is about the transformation of this kind of thing, the kind of housing that, that workers were uh, living in to new housing being built, new streets. And um, uh, there were also clubs. Uh, so here's some of the housing that was built in the city, enormous uh, projects. Um, here's some of the, these were workers clubs designed by the Vesnin brothers and then architecture students, a lot of photographs of uh, 
female architecture students. And um, then there was also research uh, culture that was you know, cultivated, that was expanded, this kind of experimentation. And it's also interesting, actually, that the Soviets decided to keep the black town. They were, um, you know, in general, actually, um, socialist, socialism is, is a great sort of pre preservation project because um, it's too expensive to tear stuff down, but you build outside. Um, but so the, the black town, it was recognized by the, the socialist state that this was uh, a, an urban form that was conducive to um, experimentation and to innovation. So um, this early, sorry, revolutionary period, um, again, was also short-lived um, until sort of the late 30s or so. And during World War II, interesting little episode here, uh, Hitler planned to invade and to grab Baku's oil fields. Um, and here there's some film footage that shows Hitler uh, and his you know, general staff um, with a cake, enjoying this cake, um, which is Baku and the Caspian Sea. The Caspian Sea apparently was, you know, Kirsch, Kirsch or something, uh, chocolate sauce, who knows. And um, so while he was enjoying his cake, actually, uh, Stalin filled the oil wells with concrete uh, so that if they got there, they wouldn't get the oil. And uh, they never got there. They were stopped in Stalingrad. But Stalin uh, managed to uh, destroy the onshore wells in Baku. So after the war, most of uh, Soviet extraction, and here this is this map that shows the targeting of oil uh, in Baku, that there were these very detailed, and again, the, 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 the Library of Congress is full of this stuff. It's fascinating. Maps showing uh, you know, how, how the Germans mapped uh, the region, and then, you know, in the Cold War, you know, how the Americans mapped the region. So um, anyhow, after the war, um, most of Soviet oil extraction moved to the Volga Basin, and which became known as the second Baku. But Baku remained this, uh, the center of oil uh, equipment production and research. And throughout the Cold War, actually, the economic, um, and this is interesting in connection with, with uh, <laughs> built form, carbon form, that the economic importance of the oil industry continued to give um, Baku uh, kind of privileged access planners uh, and architects to funds and to scientific knowledge and to tools that allowed them to experiment. And here's an example. Uh, in the 1940s, before anywhere else, the Soviets began um, offshore drilling because Stalin had the onshore wells. Um, and they built one of these more extraordinary uh, structures of Soviet oil and urbanism. Uh, it's called Nekdashlari, which is oily rocks. Uh, it was done in 1949. It's 40 kilometers offshore. Uh, it's both an oil extraction site and an urban settlement. It has thousands of workers. Uh, apartment buildings, schools, libraries, shops, clinics, cinemas. There were 330 kilometers of bridges and roadways and platforms and causeways and 2,000 oil rigs uh, and miles of pipelines. So it was this extraordinary structure. There are many films about it. Who's just spent a lot of time there? And here's some details of it. So it was the first... Um, offshore drilling installation. And it was also the first micro rayon or micro district, the unit, the new unit of settlement of Soviet planning, socialist planning actually, after uh, World War II. And, uh, which, and it was one of the first sites where this, uh, the micro rayon was built uh, and, and experimented on. Uh, and it was the only one, of course, on water. And these are some more recent images. It's impossible to get there. When I was there, uh, we tried to, because, you know, Ivan Bond loves to go up in a helicopter. 
And um, so we wanted to at least go up in a helicopter and we, we would be told it's no problem. And then about a week or two later, it was still no problem, but it was, it was just not going to happen. <laughs> so uh, it's very, it's in one of the James Bond movies too. Um, so anyhow, uh, Nefegash Lari was really interesting um, for uh, just this experimentation that oil enables in, and in terms of uh, architectural form. So just quickly now, during the Khrushchev and the Brezhnev decades, sort of the 1960s, 1970s, uh, there was this upsurge in economic and urban development. Um, in Baku, and it became uh, an even more important research center uh, related to oil than it had been before the war. Uh, and there was a huge expansion of um, uh, institutional buildings and research centers. And this is a publication from the early 70s showing uh, new research institutions and also uh, a lot of housing. So it was this sort of massive institutional and housing program. And um, at this point, again, uh, the USSR had become the world's largest oil and gas producing country, which is uh, still. And um, it was almost uh, totally energy self-sufficient, actually, during that time. But of, co of course, the, the environmental cost was enormous. Um, as I said, uh, these inefficient, non-economic or uneconomic practices uh, that caused this enormous ecological damage um, and in the end led to technological lag as well. So after independence, as we know, uh, international investment and expertise flowed into Baku again, as it had done, you know, almost exactly 100 years before and uh, resulted in that building boom that we looked at before. And so here are some of these images where this is the, the old town, the old black town, uh, the factories and so forth, that we were wandering around and there were still these relics. And, but here was a sign saying, this is what's, uh, what's coming. And <clears throat> so the, the largest urban architectural project uh, that's underway in Baku, it's actually, I think, close to being finished, is uh, designed by the engineering firm of Atkins together with Foster and Partners. And it's built absolutely on top of the black town. And, uh, and it's this new vast um, CDD. Uh, one of the difficulties here is that it is built on top of the, the black town and there was no cleaning done uh, of the, you know, underneath it. So people are not doing very much. Um, but it's also, it's modeled on Houseman's Paris. Uh, again, and it, it replicates that program with all of the violence uh, and displacements that um, it produced. And here you can see it um, sort of under construction. And then there's, I'm going to end with something that I think is one of the strangest and most telling uh, urban projects at the moment, um, which is there's a government program, sponsored program of limestone recladding of Soviet era uh, panel buildings, and you can sort of see this here, um, again, creating these sort of 19th century French uh, facades on the buildings. And the idea here, it's intended to give a coherent and monumental shape to the urban streetscape, um, while also at the same time hiding uh, from view the, the dilapidated and unregulated construction that's, that's behind it. But these, the interesting thing here is that these new facades are, are not merely facing. You could sort of see a little bit here. I'll show you in the next part. They're actually shells that encase these old buildings. There's a five foot uh, space between the old and the new. And the windows are not usually, or always any, you know, not, not predominantly aligned with each other. So that these interior spaces are quite dark. So it's pure uh, sort of Kotemkin contem city urbanism. And you can see that here. Here are the old buildings and they're just being encased in these shells. It's extraordinary. And it's one of the reasons is that, that a lot of the Soviet housing was really well built actually. 
And so they're just attaching these shells uh, onto them. And so there's this kind of, I think, hallucinatory merging of socialist and capitalist space in these buildings and, and sort of transforming them. And it's, it's really, a, you know, like one of those Russian nesting dolls of contradictions. So and here you see it again. And the tragic irony of it is that it's actually destroying the historical fabric of the city. It's also displacing thousands uh, of uh, Baku's residents who are not compensated and so on. But it's also, I'd like to end with um, one of the most interesting monuments, I think, that's been emerging in uh, Baku that are uh, essentially accidental and undesigned. And that is that as this historical fabric of Baku disappears, this oil and gas infrastructure um, becomes ever more visible, actually. And you can see that. Here you could see it all over. I have tons of images of it because it fascinates me. So that it it literally pervades the daily lives of people uh, who who live in Baku. And um, so here are some more images of. Uh, it just struck me about how you're constantly circulating uh, through this infrastructure. And Brian Larkin, an anthropologist, has pointed out that infrastructures are meta pragmatic objects that operate as signs of themselves. And so they have this double political agency, and I find this very compelling actually, as objects and also the meanings that they trigger. And particularly, I think, when they're as visible and, and ubiquitous uh, as these above ground pipelines are in, in Baku. So they they almost become ornamental, but they, you know, they go around garages, they're they're just um, and yeah, people are constantly circulating through them. And I think that they're, uh, you know, without question, the most resonant monuments that are uh, in contemporary Baku, when they operate on these multiple levels to instantiate the complex uh, interrelation of oil and urbanism. Um, and they also uh, give form to the material foundations. And I think that's another thing that I find fascinating. Uh, on which um, the city of Baku is built. And they bind it, you know, very visibly to that industrial past uh, and to the, you know, the foundation for the city, the bedrock. And they frame these spaces of everyday life. So to me, and I love this picture of the little boy, and there he is, he's got it, um, that they signal, you know, not only the material and the human resources, that uh, shape the city of Baku, that, they're, that those resources, human and uh, material, are finite and exhaustible. But I think that also, and I hope this is the case, that Baku's history and the knowledge it produces might be one of the city's more valuable resources for um, imagining a sustainable future. <laughs> So first off, thank you uh, for that fabulous lecture. I have so many thoughts and questions. I feel like I want to just talk to you for hours, but <laughs> people are going here for hours. Um, but maybe I'll just start with what is maybe a more general question, um, which has to do with your framework around uh, the relationship between oil production and the socio-spatial formation of the city, which is kind of at the root of the whole thing. So you're really arguing that, um, you know, not just the, you know, in terms of carbon form, not just that urban form is kind of resultant uh, in industrial processes, or even that, you know, in the beginning of your book, you make the distinction between uh, built landscapes that are shaped by energy like a suburb, where we kind of imagine there's an influx of energy and everything sort of spreads out and we have this kind of resultant thing. So your book is very different, right? It's, and, and your work, right? You're arguing that industry is entangled with urban form, there's a reciprocity between them. Um, and so there's a moment where uh, you also describe the, the city's image of itself. And uh, there's an idea of the, the city as a project and as a projection of a kind of culture, self-identity. And that all is sort of entangled with 
spatial paradigm and cultural notions. And, um, and so I find that uh, really important and this question of self-image and self-perception because I feel like um, that emphasis on projection and uh, almost a authorial emphasis as opposed to the kind of resultant one, I think goes against the grain of how we tend to think about urbanization processes, right? And I think that in part comes from neoliberal real estate and the way that kind of development occurs right now that it almost seems like everything is beyond our control. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, Baku seems like a city that, uh, you know, so many things happen and we look at the resultant built form and there is some chaos in it, of course. But um, but nonetheless, there is this thread, right, your whole narrative around that kind of making of the city as kind of intentional. And then I'm particularly interested in that sense also in the Soviet era, because you have this architectural avant-garde, right, that comes in as, you know, we are constructing a new Soviet subject and we will do this with architecture, we will do this with urbanism. So I guess that's all to say that my question in some ways is just about whether we have, if our, our frameworks for thinking about the city are different from then, do we have similar frameworks? Because if we also are going to ask ourselves, you know, what is this kind of transition to come? What is the city for a new, I don't know what we'll call this, the new post-capitalist, post-carbon subject. We don't know exactly what we'll, right. we'll call ourselves. Maybe that's part of the problem. But um, do we have the same frameworks given that we tend to just imagine the urban as something that is constantly eluding our control? Do you, I don't know, does that question sort of make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you're talking, you said the urban, but I think one of the, the things that I find interesting in the, the whole discourse around um, oil is that uh, people talk a lot about oil does this and oil does that. Oil makes suburbs, oil destroys the environment, oil, you know, as if oil was an active agent. And, um, you know, what does oil do? I think that, that uh, it isn't an actor, really. I mean, it's not an actor. It's what's uh, it's being exploited, actually. Um, it's being used. And I think that oil can give agency and depending on how it's used. Uh, and it can also be very destructive. But oil itself is kind of innocent <laughs> in a way. I mean, it's, it's, and I think that it's important for us to think that way uh, when we're trying to do something about the situation that we're in now, um, that you can't blame things on coal, you can't blame things on oil, you can blame things on, you know, what people are doing with them. It's a simple, stupid point. But it's one of the things that, that uh, I find really problematic in the way in which people talk a lot about uh, you know, that there are regimes of power, there are spatial regimes, and so on, that have to do, that are, or, or just talking about oil. Oil does this, oil does that. So I think that, you know, that's not your question. Or we're talking about urbanization. Well, I guess the question is about how we think about the the city. And it's, and I mean, in many ways, I agree with you. It's not oil. It's it's oil plus, right? All of these things. It's the, as you call it, the volatile mix, right? Right. And I think that, you know, as architects, as we think about what it is that we need to do next yeah. in a transition that's coming, we need to understand those moments where architecture is operative or the, or the city itself is an agent, or at least the architect is an agent in yeah. kind of consolidating um, because if there is an actor, I mean, certainly the architect and the planner are, are really important actors yeah. in your narrative. Yeah. And so they come in and propose spatial organizations that allow the industry to flourish in a particular way. So certainly the architect and the planner uh, serve as important actors in this story. And I guess I think of that as very different from how we talk about architecture and planning today. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just wondering how you see those differences. And, and is this a question of... Um, I don't know, reframing how we think about the contemporary city, or is it simply that the contemporary city is produced in different ways at this point? Because the history of early Baku is, of course, very different from contemporary Baku. Yeah. Yeah. And 
so I think that, you know, it's also thinking about, I mean, the whole issue of the suburb and so forth, that there are so many factors. And I think that one needs to think about all of the entanglements. We're talking about um, industrial capitalism, right? But and, and that's not also a thing in its, I mean, it's multifaceted. And so, you know, the the making of the suburbs, for instance, and oil participation have very much to do with Fordism and car production. And a bit of in an egg here that, you know, cars and certainly, um, you know, these forces go together. And in there, you have planners and architects. And as we know, um, they require uh, clients. And, um, and, you know, money to do what they want to do. And I think that, you know, one of the things that interests me very much about the transitional condition is that that's, I mean, architecture and planning require being able to take the long view, right? Because that's what planning is, actually. It's projecting. And so, you know, what happens in an environment that is unstable and that is transitional, and this is why I'm interested, how do these practices operate <laughs> in conditions like that? Um, and one of the interesting things, I mean, there are a couple of things here that, that I find interesting. One of them is that when you can't plan, and this is what I found by, you know, and this, this is one of the things also that really looking at specific sites, a kind of um, uh, site-specific history, is that, um, you know, so what are these processes when you can't plan? And uh, so that it's instability, but also a distance from power that makes these conditions. And one of the things that I noticed that happened in some of these environments is that, that architecture um, actually started to shape the city, that architects start, started to. And I did this other study on the Hudbred, actually, which was a really interesting case where they were never able to get a plan approved by, because there was always some distant source of the power was in Vienna, in Budapest, it was in, in uh, what's it called, Belgrade. And so nobody, they could never get a plan approved. And so architects started to kind of expand the city through architectural projects that were urban active. So they actually shaped urban space. They changed the way in which space was used in the city. It's really, really interesting. And the other thing I discovered is that, that actually that's far more possible to do in a socialist environment, actually, because there isn't this division between public and private property. And, you know, in the, in the capitalist city, you have public space, which is and the infrastructure that is produced by the city or whoever, it's public. And then within the block, it's private and private development. So what architects are confined to is the parcel, or if they're you know super lucky, the block, right? but not to anything beyond that. But in a socialist context, you can actually plan without having a plan. You can do it with architecture. You could shape urban space. And I think that is fascinating, actually. But also how architects during that particular, I mean, in these various different periods of time when it was impossible to actually plan, a bunch of architects kind of got together at various times and decided, I mean, not necessarily let's do this, but it became a practice that evolved. And that you would build, you know, you would experiment with things. You would try something out. You would uh, get, you know, um, uh, you would build support for something that, I mean, you know, acting like politicians, but also actively shaping urban space with architecture. So that's one of the, probably off on a different tangent from where you were going for. But the, the issue of um, sort of agency in planning, and I find that really interesting, and that's why transitional moments are really interesting, because new things happen. Um, and, and it's out of necessity, actually, you know? 
that circumstances are such that you just can't continue the way you've been doing it and that normative methods don't work anymore. Right. I think that that isn't so far from where I was going in a way because my next question was going to be about the difference between capitalist and socialist space, um, in part because I think your, your history of Baku shows this capitalist origin, then the socialist period, and then kind of away, back away from the, the socialist yeah. planning. And so I find that really interesting. And um, I think that the way that you describe the city's early formation makes really clear that uh, capitalism comes with this spatial framework, as you described. So that distinction between the public space and the, the parcelized private space, I think, is essential. And so in some ways, I started to think as you were talking that maybe capitalist space or in capitalist space, the city serves as a framework, whereas in socialist space, the city is more of a choreography of relationships because you have this kind of, um, you know, the worker settlements go here and, you know, there's a kind of choreography of like, okay, let's think about all of the relations and then kind of plan them out. Um, and so I think that's that's interesting and, and certainly not something that we can necessarily do under current models of development in the United States, which I think leads to part of the reason why we feel relatively stuck. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we are confined to the parcel. I think that's absolutely right. And this kind of parcel by parcel development means that we kind of endlessly see, and that's what makes us feel that the kind of development is out of control, right? It's just this endless one luxury condo after another, and there's nothing right. you can do about it. Um, so I think that's really that's really interesting. So maybe I'll just ask one more question before opening it up. And this is kind of a selfish question. I'll, I'll confess, um, because as you know, um, the exhibition that I'm working on that will go up here in the spring is about a, a confrontation with carbon form. And one of the goals is to define carbon form and really think about its spatial characteristics uh, and, you know, not in generalities, but really starting to get very specific. So I kind of just want to pick your brain. Um, and you, you said in your lecture and you write in your book that one of the things we can really see with the relationship between oil and urban form is circulation becoming primary. And then you also call about call it the production of difference. Yeah. And these, these really important characteristics of the carbon form that you're studying, which is Baku. And for me, the question of circulation makes total sense. And I think that we can start to see that in a lot of different precedents. But I was more curious also about the production of difference. Um, because there's a difference that oil makes as you describe it, but then there's also differences in the difference between things. And then you have that image of uh, Baku as layered and you have the, the first Muslim city and then the 19th century, 20th century, then the towers. And that, I mean, that image is incredible. So obviously there's a kind of difference there. Um, and so I'm just wondering, do you think that difference is one of the characteristics of carbon form? Because I think those definitions of difference are kind of not the same, and then also maybe what might others be? Because in some ways you bring forward in your study the question of the grid, um, but at the same time, the white town that follows doesn't have the grid. So um, in many ways, I feel like maybe the characteristics of carbon form are less about specific geometries, but more about specific priorities that are then solved with formal solutions. Um, but in any case, I guess I'm just curious to hear from you what you think are the characteristics based on this really in-depth and amazing study that you've done, kind of specific spatial and formal char characteristics of carbon form that we can begin to translate uh, into other, other precedents of carbon form. Well, I guess that <clears throat> my way of um, understanding it is that, you know, that the idea of carbon form is very much the same as the difference that oil makes, let's say. Mm. Um, it's not just about oil, but it's, so there are so many factors that determine what urban and architectural forms are produced, right? There are a thousand different economic factors, political factors, local legal factors, uh, you know, so many. But the question was, and, you know, I went into this and in all of these studies, which I'm making a transition, went into it thinking, you know, you always go in with an idea. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this is about, um, because the last, yeah, I mean, I went into the Dogbert thing thinking that it was about the, the socialist, post-socialist transition. And it was, except that what I found there was that this was a place that had been in transition for 150 years. 
and that it was just there was there had been no stability. So it wasn't about that transition, but it was about transition. And then I went into Baku saying, oh, well, this is about post-socialist transition and then about transitions and so forth. And got there and I realized, no, it's about oil. <laughs> it's really about oil. And you have all of these other factors, these structures that you can go into it, thinking that you can understand it in terms of, you know, post-socialism or socialism. But then the, it's the difference that oil makes. <laughs> and so I think that when you're thinking about carbon form, you're they're all it's it's not a particular kind of form, but it's what carbon the the what the difference that it makes right, to all of these other things, and that you can see it in urban form, you can see it in architectural form, but it's it's not uh, it's constantly changing too, but it's. It's the difference that it makes because it makes an economic difference. It makes a political difference. It makes a whole range of differences. <laughs> and so I think that maybe that way that you're identifying something about carbon form that is the difference that it makes. Um, and maybe that's the way <clears throat> into understanding uh, how that's different from other forms. Right. And the same with modernity. I mean, well, modernity, it's all modernity, but it's uh, its its saying what is the difference that carbon right. makes here? Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, I frame a lot of the conversations in my classes precisely around that. And, and the students tend to look at precedents and then they have to argue why it is a carbon form specifically, right? right. And there's this kind of research that has to go around, but as, as you put it, what is the difference that the energy source makes? Yeah. Um, so certainly that's that's an entry point. Um, I want to open it up to the audience just to make sure that we have time. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I found the, your, your presentation really fascinating, but most fascinating of all were the first few images where you show the Suryastra temple. Yeah. Because it's something that reminds one of the bases of architecture in the West, so to speak. You know, the Grecian temple, yeah. which is based on a wood building. And the architectural order is a conversion into stone, into architectural objects of the pieces of construction of that. And you would say the same thing about Japanese carpentry. Yeah. No? In this case, it seems like these Zoroastrian temples that you showed, they made an architecture out of the celebration of the fire produced by petroleum. Carbon form. So it is something which speaks that in a very eloquent way. No? And yet, the rest of your presentation, uh, books about capital and buildings that basically seek again and again and again to imitate Paris, you know, the cliche, frankly, you know, the boulevard and the, and the, 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 the axial monumental structures. Right. Other than perhaps the whatever you might find in terms of the architectural decoration on some of those buildings that is a reference to the architectural traditions. Of that. <clears throat> it's not saying anything, you know, it's just a cliche. No. So how, if, my question then comes back to the issue of what is the, the because the, I imagine that it almost must be a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a hidden uh, ex existence of the vernacular architecture in that region, because there surely is a vernacular architecture, and it surely survived, because vernacular architectures have a strength that comes from building traditions that local people learn. They carry, you know, they inherit by being taught by people who are carpenters or whatever, or stonemasons who practice that, and it's carried down generation to generation. And it exists beside official construction, beside official building, and it's something that persists. And how is that affected by this history? How is that, how do people attempt to incorporate that? And more importantly, most of them, because all of that was eminently sustainable, right? How does that become the basis for an architect today for the future? Well, there's a very, I mean, just a, as a, an example here, that's very interesting. <laughs> that um, there's a vernacular that uh, is characteristic of, of Baku that I found fascinating too. And that was, uh, again, and it's part of something, it, this was an environment that was changing a lot because it was coming under different rule and political systems and so forth. So that 
the vernacular was changing all the time as well. Um, but there's certain materials that were used over and over again that become basically the basis of the materiality for the vernacular. There's a lot of stone, a lot of limestone. And one of the interesting things that found in Buck was that though these buildings, vernacular buildings, um, many of which have been torn down, um, had these ex extraordinary foundations, strong stone foundations that were massive and didn't make much sense in terms of the building itself. But what we realized in it, that there was a whole construction that had to do with change and that buildings were built with very strong foundations, stone buildings, that up to, say, a first floor. And the idea was that as the city would grow, as people would get, that, that you would add stories on it. That it was an architecture of change, that it was built into that. So that's a really interesting vernacular, actually, that is particular to that place. There was all kinds of ornamentation, but a lot of the ornamentation was a kind of creative or not necessarily, um, uh, I mean, there was a lot of dispute about that, but this kind of construction was totally vernacular and fascinating because you would find that, you know, here were these foundations, this is a small house built on these enormous foundations. Then during the sort of early capitalist period, one level got put on it. And then during the socialist period, there were, you know, stories built on top of it too. So that it was, it was an architecture that was, you know, of accommodation and of change, but it came out of the ground. Is it returning? Are people looking at that again? I mean, you know, are they looking at it? We were certainly looking at it because it just struck us as this is unusual. You could see that that would be the origin of what you demonstrated of resurfacing these buildings with a fake. Yes, I mean, there's just a, you, the, there are these vernacular um, traditions actually that continue. And uh, there were some people actually in the university, in the in the architects, sort of who were doing historical investigation of these things. Um, so it's it's really interesting. Same thing with these, you know, these big, big blocks and the industry and how it located itself. So there are these uh, sort of local practices that are really interesting and really telling. But that's that's one of the vernacular ones. So an urban vernacular. Do we have a question from the Zoom? Yeah. yeah. I think we can. Hi, Bruce. Hey there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm actually calling in from California, and I find this really intriguing. Um, I happen to live in a city, uh, probably not unlike many cities in the U.S. Richmond in the Bay Area is right next to a pretty large refinery, and um, and so I'm wondering if there's any lessons or any projections you can make about what could happen in a post-carbon future in places where cities are occupied, even in the West, where cities are occupied next to oil infrastructure and what happens when that goes away? Is it, is it more likely to be an opportunity or a disaster? Well, you know, who knows? But you look at... <laughs> Who, you look at other sites. I mean, you look at Los Angeles. They're still nodding donkeys there, as they're called. Um, so the city kind of grew around it. Um, you know, that's a question for you. The sort of <laughs> large-scale thinking here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, that is a question I ask myself every day. Um, I lose sleep over that question. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that whether it, it, there is an opportunity or not depends on what ideas we have. And I feel like this is the moment to really have them because as Eva said really clearly, moments of transition are the ones where uh, things can happen. And, and I do think that we are in that moment. Um, and I think uh, it's also important right now to already begin to project around like what kind of changes will occur. And, and in my mind, 
the understanding of carbon form is so essential because if we understand that the form of the built environment takes its form because it's kind of pumped with energy, when that energy goes away, the form will change, right? Juxtapositions will have to change. Global supply chains will have to change. Where production occurs will have to change. So, you know, whether that is an opportunity for a disaster will vary enormously from place to place. I think it will depend a lot um, on what resources are available locally, because we've also begun to live in a way where we ignore what resources are available locally and we subsist off of things that are uh, procured globally. So, um, you know, I think that there will be different opportunities in every place um, and different risks in every place. And, and that's why I think that uh, understanding uh, like who the actors are when change happens is extraordinarily important. And I think that, um, you know, as an educator and um, and as a designer, for me, asking that question of what is it that architects and designers need to know about their own position within that change is, is essential. So I don't know if that answers your question as much as it affirms the importance of your question, um, but I don't know if there's necessarily an answer right now. I don't, I don't know if we have it. I don't, yeah. I personally think we're ready for the transition at all. I think we're, we're far behind. Um, which is one of the reasons I lose sleep at night over the question. So. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I'm curious whether you guys think that Baku is trying to erase its oil past, or is it? It's, it certainly doesn't seem to be celebrating it, right? So, what what is the attitude there? Do you think? Well, I think that it's. Uh, I mean, it it the whole economy is dependent on oil and gas. And um, it's, so it's not about a productive uh, uh, economy or, you know, place. And what's so interesting about Baku is that, is that it was a productive place. Uh, and that urbanism, for me, what's interesting is that urbanism, uh, urban form, um, and thinking created uh, the possibility for that kind of uh, innovation. And I, I think that that's, you know, that's something that we need to understand too, because there's the, the kind of white city architecture and there's a completely innovative architecture that's actually making things possible. And so architecture has to find its place. And there are architects who are designing these buildings like the plane towers and so forth. But there are ways, I think, that, you know, looking at examples like this that, that can actually inform architecture, that there is some agency there. And to actually use that agency and figure out what you can do, um, I think is very important, and it's something that we should really think about in architecture schools. And I, and you know, how to be effective in this. There's certain things that that we worry about. There's certain things that we want to do. There's certain things that we we can do. And I think that uh, you know, exploring that in terms of thinking about doing. I mean, doing it through architecture, actually. Not trying to make architecture do something else, but how architecture works in relationship, you know, you know, if you want to change architecture, you think about typology, for instance, right? That's where the social and the spatial interests intersect. You want to change society, you could start thinking about typology. If you want to change the way in which the city works, you think about the relationship between public and private, things like that. I couldn't agree more with that. And actually that's the reason why the next speaker in this series is Maria Giudici because of her work on typology. And I really love her writing on that aspect. And I couldn't agree more with a question of where the spatial and the social intersect through this formal question of type. Um, and she's someone who really talks about the way in which um, architecture participates in subject formation, right? And the reification of the nuclear family, which becomes both a social unit and a space It is a building block for the city and, and for society. And um, I think also, and I wonder what you think about this, I think Soviet architecture is really interesting in that regard as well, because as they were starting to argue, we need a new Soviet uh, subject, what they needed 
to correspond with that were all of these new building typologies to basically hold that subjectivity or write it into space, right? And hold all of those uh, social relations. And, and I don't know if we think about that enough. And, you know, as you and I were talking about at the beginning, um, before the lecture started, so much of the conversation around environmental questions is, is limited to building performance. And in many ways, we ignore then all the work that architecture does to hold our social structures in place. Um, and if we understand that, then changing those spatial structures can be one of the ways in which we rewrite social relationships. Um, and I don't mean that in a social engineering way, but in the recognition that even if we stay within the status quo and we build a luxury condo, uh, we are participating in, in the holding of those social structures. And so what are the other kinds of spaces that we can create that give form to other possibilities? And I think that's an essential, yeah, essential question. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Trying the discussion, but, but when you compare uh, Astana and Baku, which both have kind of like bottomless olives thanks to hydrocarbon belt, do you, as, as an architect, do you see it as an advantage to have more money and more resources and build something like kind of on canvas from the ground up? Or is part of your theory about why Baku has a little bit more potential because it does have this sort of ancient, but it does have ancient history, but it has on whatever, 19th century relics that yeah. give it this kind of texture that's immovable. Is that kind of your view? Well, actually, um, no, I wouldn't say that uh, because I think that, you know, we, we sort of, uh, um, the, the whole socialist experience, certainly the Soviet experience, because uh, so much sort of Kind of awful stuff was was built uh, and created. That the ideas are really interesting. Like this micro region that I was talking about, where it's basically a socio-spatial diagram. And if we're coming back to that in our thinking about cities. That you think about an area that people live in, and they were calculating the kinds of needs, daily and weekly needs, that had to be within you know, uh, it's this sort of 15 minute city and then for other needs and there was transportation and there were, there were certain basic things that were provided, you know, transportation, housing, education, uh, and occupation, right? I mean, everybody had a job. But so these cities that are being made, you know, like Astana and, and Baku, I think that what I was suggesting sort of aspirationally at the end was that if they if people actually look at this history and understand it for more than just looking at the forms uh, that relationship between uh, industry <clears throat> urbanization and, and the possibilities that that there's a lot to learn there and think about how you might move forward because also I mean but you still think they have an ambition to be able to a, a world city because it doesn't even yeah. seem like they do because they have such a closed economy and they have so much money coming in. Yeah. That well, they they aspire to that, and and that's part of this post oil urbanism because they realize that oil is, you know, exhaust. Uh, you know, you can't. They're. I mean, they still have oil, but they're not. You know, a huge. Uh, player anymore or other parts of Russia and other parts of the world that are producing oil the, the Gulf um, so that they, it can't be the main thing and so they're trying to diversify their economy but um, but through you know, attracting you know, companies head offices and you know, investment of that kind investment in real estate so it's, uh, no, it's a bit of a, uh, you know, it's a dead end. <laughs> in, in that, thank you for the talk. Um, it was kind of an amazing view into a chunk of history that I'm not that familiar with, even though the historical moments yeah. I'm super familiar with, but yeah. to see how they play that in a particular place is super fascinating. Um, well, in, re in regards to a sense of crisis and, um, Lisa and I have often talked about, like, why is it that people 
why is it that the climate crisis actually is not creating any sense of urgency really among, among, among people? So um, can Baku, like what is Baku's timeline? When does the oil run out? How, how is it, we, you refer to it as a post oil city frequently, and yet it sounds like all of its capital continues to come from the sale of oil. So, I mean, are people, so does it have 100 years of oil production? Because when you look at its history and the enormity of the changes that you viewed, it's over an incredibly compressed period of time. Yeah. It's 130 years. It's right. hardly any time at all. And yet, if their oil runs out in 10 years and they don't have a plan, and they're not really facing it, then, like, of course, people think that a, a climate crisis that's on a 100-year uh, fuse, but think of the enormity of the things that happened in Baku over a yeah. hundred years. The enormity of changes, both predictable and completely unpredictable. Yeah. How does one plan <laughs> um, in a world in the world that we have inherited over that kind of length of time? I think that that's the, the problem that we're yes. facing, isn't it? Yeah, but I guess my own question is, do they really have a sense of when they have to be post-oil? Well, I think that they realize that it's now, mm -hmm. um, because they still have the oil. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, they've gone through various phases, like when Stalin filled up the, the wells with concrete. So they kind of, you know, the onshore stuff is, is pretty minimal. So they're, they're basically, they're getting it out of <coughs> Caspian, and they're digging into mm -hmm. there, but then there are all of these issues of you know who owns what from right. the sea, right? So that everybody around the Caspian is you know whatever. But I think that there is sense that it's finite, and that it's mm -hmm. that you cannot just rely on that for a whole range of reasons. And so that's why they're trying to uh, diversify in that way, making Baku into a big you know, uh, money generating city so like New York, right? Or London. Can I intercede for a moment? I've had the experience of attending several COP conferences where these issues are supposed to be being addressed straight on. And it's very clear, for instance, the one in Glasgow, where the only interest was finance capital to take over and assure their, their concerns and their interests over everything else. Yeah. The same thing is true of petroleum. Yep. Look at what's happening with this confrontation of the Ukraine, the, the sabotage of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline by the United States to sell its own terribly dirty uh, frack gas. You know, yep. you were mentioning before that they have a pipeline, they could easily use a pipeline to develop. You know, there, there is unfortunately because of this being controlled by two concepts, which is international finance capital and its workings. And the other one is the unfortunate notion is that the world, the urbanization is going to appear around the world because we have almost 10 billion people. That's not true. Really, the future lies in looking at the rural component of cities. You know, I like to tell people that it's Siena in the Renaissance. This is a city that the population wouldn't even make it today to an urban statistical unit. And statistics, unfortunately, is the way these people think. You know, Siena was became the, the place that it became, the city that it became, the architecture that it fostered, because it was a region. Mm -hmm. It was a civic republic. It was a city where the population was primarily in the countryside, as continues to be the case today. I attended a conference at the UN just the other day where they were talking about how to extend the uh, connectivity of Wi-Fi to people uh, in, in most remote regions, something like a third of humanity is beyond the reach of Wi-Fi, right? And this is a group that comes out of NASA, um, and they're interested with, with you know, making satellites that can connect with them. You know, we're talking about a third of humanity living in what are primarily 
rural and will continue to be rural conditions. It don't necessarily need to change. The problem is the thought connected to that, which reduces everything to large urban agglomerations. And within that typology of buildings that one sees these glass skyscrapers and the capitalist CBD type vision of what a city should be. It is such a cliche, combining the CBD with something that resembles Paris and its layout. That's not a city. That is a monstrosity. Yeah. Well, I think that also reminds me of another aspect of your question, Elizabeth, because you're asking, you know, when do they have to be post oil? And that's a central part of your question. But also, I think it's important to not conflate post oil with somehow them having exited carbon modernity, because what they are doing is simply re um, allocating their energy landscape, basically. And if they are not going to be producing the oil themselves, they are just becoming dependent on production elsewhere, and they're following the trend of moving away from production towards a, you know, a post-industrial, more consumer-based society. And what I find really interesting is the role that the form plays in both of those. I would call both of those carbon form. Yeah. They just play a really different role within that story. And um, I think that the, in that sense, the question of production to me seems essential. And so their post-oil moment is less important in my mind or less interesting than what will be their post carbon modernity moment when they realize that they can't, right. you know, do that anymore. Well, I, I think one of the interesting subtexts between you and the speaker are that even, um, Professor Blau talks very, very specifically about oil. What difference does oil make? You use the term carbon, yeah. which would include many more energy systems than just oil. And yeah. so what is the specificity of oil? And like, what should we be looking out for, for the other kind of carbon systems? So I, I think that's yeah. part of the interesting yeah. friction between yeah, yeah. the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just like, is, is, tim is the era of timber part of carbon? Yes. Form? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean it, everything is almost. Yeah. yeah. So how far back do you, for oil, you go back to 1897. And right. right. How far back we go with carbon? And that's maybe not the question for tonight, but yeah. I find it to be in like kind of an overarching question in this conversation. I mean, yeah. everything is, yeah. is, everything is part of it. Yeah. But it's, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. The wood, concrete. Well, say. when, you know, Europeans came to the Ameri the Americas and yeah. deforested America, deforested yeah. New York State, effectively, was that not a huge endeavor of extraction? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, and I would, yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, yeah, and I can give a sort of brief answer to that, which yes. is the, the use of carbon that I uh, employ is really to be specific about hydrocarbons as an energy source. Right. But I, of course, carbon is in everything and it is in every energy source that you use. If you burn wood, you're, there's still carbon being burned there. Um, it's simply the density of carbon that makes a difference. Um, so in terms of the difference that carbon makes, I would say that um, in terms of an energy source, hydrocarbons have a density of energy that changed the game. But I think that there are many conflicting timelines within energy transition, and it's all relative to what you're measuring. You get a different timeline. If you're looking at energy density, then the adoption of fossil fuels is a big break. But if you're looking at changing techniques of energy capture, then really you, you're going to look at something more around the onset of industry, right? You're going to look at colonialism as a totally different yeah. thing. So I think that there's no single timeline. I think there is a multiplicity of timelines. Um, and I think that's really important. And, and perhaps I wouldn't say that there's a friction as much as there's simply a difference between like that Eve is looking at a very specific case study where oil right. is the operative energy source. And I'm looking more broadly at the difference of hydrocarbons make and for the built environment and trying to kind of understand patterns. So, I, you know, my kind of study here, and it's not, you know, the limit to what I think about, but is to look closely at something and then see how it, what it tells us about other broader things. And you're looking broadly right. and then the specificity kind of comes out of that too. Right. But I wanted to just say something about the uh, the urban and the rural, that there's a lot of research being done now about, I mean, it's being framed in various different ways, small town urbanism, uh, but looking at um, 
small cities, small places of production, and that a lot of, of these uh, um, towns that were, you know, little uh, like Manchester, New Hampshire, and places like that, that were little industrial hubs that um, kind of disappeared with the deindustrialization. Um, but that there's a lot of thinking about how to uh, actually think differently about, you know, actually producing things and mm -hmm. manufacturing and so forth. So that's very positive um, kind of research that's going on at the moment. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, and, and sort of thinking sort of through that divide of the rural and the urban, that it really doesn't exist anymore. And the whole theories about planetary urbanization, that um, really the whole planet is urbanized. So, yeah. I think this has to be our last question, and then we have to wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, your presentation is really thank you. And uh, thank you very much. That was that was absolutely amazing, all of the aspects. And what was the inspiration? Why 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 that topic? Why we were inspired to research on such a absolutely fascinating topic? Why why is the how correlates the involved in that unique unique set of film? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I lived here for 31 years, but since the war, where we came here, so why Papu? What was what inspired you that much? You went there. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, yeah. How that happened? <coughs> I had done this uh, sort of research on the post-socialist city or trying to understand, I mean, my motivation actually a long time ago was I wanted to understand the socialist city before it disappeared. And so, uh, and I had done some research and looked at archives and done an exhibition uh, on, um, cities in Central and Eastern Europe. And, and so I developed a research project actually to look at the city of Zagreb, because, which is in the former Yugoslavia, because I had been there and I knew that there were great archives and there was terrific modern architecture and the place just seemed really interesting and it had all of those things. So I, I raised money for it and did a two semester seminar actually took students there for two semesters and it was amazing and then did all of this additional research and analysis and produced a book so that book got into the hands of somebody in Baku actually and so I was invited to Baku and um and that's where it became clear to me that I was thinking through the wrong lens or looking through the wrong lens and that it was about oil and that it was not something that I hadn't thought about before. But boy, did it become really interesting. And so, it, and, and, and because of my interest in transitions and the understanding transitions. But I, I'd love to talk to you about both. Yes, me too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.